Good morning, everyone. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome. I want to welcome those who are visitors this morning. I know we have visitors from Braemar, Scotland, which I'm told is near Balmoral, where the Queen hangs out on weekends. From Calgary in Alberta, from Peterborough, Ontario, and from Toronto, which is here on PEI and also in Ontario. I want to welcome the Reverend Sandy McLean and, and Mrs. McLean Lila, and they're in town for a secret event. Uh, I don't know how anyone doesn't know about that event by now, but you're not going to hear about it from me. But it's good to see you, Sandy. Welcome, and Lila. And we also have some visitors from uh, Halifax. And if there are others whom I haven't mentioned, please be assured that you are welcome. And following the service, there'll be some um, cold drinks and some cookies on the lawn. And we hope you'll have a moment to stop with us so that we can get to know you better. I want to just run through some announcements. Well, first of all, birthdays. Gail Brady will celebrate on August the 19th. And Howard Murray will be 84 on August the 20th. Marion Ald will be 101 years old on August 21st. Marion is the second oldest member of the congregation. And happy birthday, or happy wedding anniversary to Lorne and Joyce Kaiser, who are celebrating 67 years of marriage today. And uh, their daughter Margaret is here. Maybe they're watching on television. Okay. We have a new moderator in the United Church of Canada. She is the now Right Reverend Jordan Cantwell. And she comes from Saskatchewan, where she has been in rural ministry, uh, but she is a well-known social activist within the United Church. And she brings her gifts and her passion for uh, ministry uh, to us at this time. So our prayers and our good wishes are with her, and she replaces the now Right Reverend Gary Patterson. As you all know, at least if you live in Charlottetown, you know that we had a fire across the street last Sunday, a 12-unit apartment building burned, and on this Saturday, August the 22nd at 5.30 p.m., we're having a fundraiser dinner and to raise some support for the people who suffered loss in the fire. We're giving tickets out for free. Uh, you will be asked for a donation at the dinner, but in order to get in, you must have a ticket because we need to know how many people are planning to attend. Ellen Locke Doron uh, will be handing out tickets uh, following the service. Now, here's a very important part of this announcement. Ken McDonald, will you stand up, please? There you are. There, Ken McDonald is in charge of recruiting servers, etc. He's having a really difficult time because people aren't home. They're all at the beach or the cottage or the golf course. And so he's making phone calls and getting no answers. It would be a great help to Ken if you're able to help in any way on the 22nd, if you would uh, contact him um, before the end of the service, or just as the service is over, um, or if you have to go and check your planner, um, please contact Ken or leave your name at the church office, because we do need extra help, and we hope to raise a good bit of money uh, to support the people uh, who suffered loss in last Sunday's fire. To date, uh, $79,320 has been given or pledged uh, for the church roof. And I'm hoping that uh, by Labor Day we can be up pretty close to 100000 
Registration for Sunday School will happen on September the 13th. And not only registration, but uh, Sunday School will begin that day, so they have a full class schedule planned. And then um, Martha Deacon wants to say a word about uh, the future. Thanks, Donnie. That was a bonus. Good morning, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to report to you that we had our first discernment, discerning our future meeting on August the 4th, and it was really well attended despite the fact we were getting into the really good weather at that point. And I would like to invite you, uh, any of you on the, who are on the TV or if you have family and friends who aren't here and anyone who's here, to consider joining us Two Saturdays, two weeks ago, uh, two weeks from yesterday, on August the 29th, from 9:30 in the morning till 12 noon, and if you can, um, I can assure you, it will be a lively time to talk about the future of our church, where we're going. The people who came on August 4th, I think, were, were intensely involved. All of our committee members were there, and we'll all be there on Saturday the 29th. So I urge you to, to, if you can at all, take the time to join us on that Saturday morning. I promise you, you will not be sorry that you come. Thanks so much. We'll sing. Open our hearts. I will thank you, God, with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in their assembly. Honor and majesty are your work. Your righteousness endures forever. You give food to those who fear you. You keep your covenant always in mind. The works of your hands are faithful and just. All your precepts are trustworthy. You sent redemption to your people. You decreed your covenant forever. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Those who practice it have good understanding. May your praise endure forever. Our first hymn is number 264, Immortal Invisible.
Let us pray. We live in a world where smart is cool. We want to follow the smart money. We are entertained by smart aleck talk show hosts. We try to outsmart one another. Some of us still think of ourselves as smart dressers. But here in this place, O oh God, we seek wisdom. We seek your wisdom. Speak to us now of the deep mystery of our being. Let your spirit carry us beyond our small certainties into the uncharted territories of grace and truth. Deconstruct us and make us anew. We pray in the name of Jesus, your word for us. Amen. I'm going to ask the children who are here this morning to join me at the front, please. Alex and Simon, Mason and Noah. In the summer, during the week, we have the church open so our visitors can drop in and look around if they want. And I was talking to some of the volunteers who were here one day, and they showed me these, these little cranes origami cranes. Have you ever seen those before? I'm sure you have. Have you seen them? Yes. Yeah. And they were left by two visitors from Japan. That was just last week. And I think the, the visitors from Japan left the cranes uh, because they see them as a symbol of peace. And last week, of course, was we were remembering the 70th anniversary of of two very horrible events, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of uh, 1945. It was the first atomic bomb, the most powerful weapon ever, um, ever exploded in the world. And it left all kinds of destruction and death uh, as a result. And that, that reminded me of a story uh, if you look at the screen, you see a young girl there. Her name is uh, Sadako uh, Sasaki. And uh, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima um, in 1945, she was just two years old, just a very young child. And she survived the bomb. She was one of the people who, who survived. But when she was 12 years old, she became very, very sick. And, and she had um, a form of cancer uh, that was a result of uh, the exposure that she had to uh, the radiation from the bomb in 1945. So the story about Sadako is that, that she heard a, a Japanese legend. And the legend was that if you could fold 1,000 of these origami cranes uh, that uh, uh, you would get a wish granted. So you know what her wish was. And she wanted to get well. And she hoped that if she made 1,000 of these little cranes that, that she would get well. Well, she only got to 644. And then sadly, she died. But, but people all around the world still remember uh, Sadako. Uh, they fold cranes, Japanese school children especially, fold these origami cranes. Uh, but, I, I, but you've probably done that too at school, have you? Has anyone done it at school? Yeah. Yep. And, and if you would like to do it, you can always go online. And there are all kinds of places online where you can learn how to fold these cranes. It's better than asking me how to fold them, uh, because I always get it wrong. 
But the cranes are, well, they were, they were a sign of hope for Sadako. They were a sign of her wish that she Today we're continuing with the David saga in the Hebrew Scriptures, except that David is no longer with us. He has been gathered to his ancestors, and his son Solomon is king. Then David slept with his ancestors, 
and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned for seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness.
Good morning. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we hear the word of God in these words. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all who practice it, says the psalmist. There are many people who find, talk about fearing God or the fear of God problematic. And they ask questions like, if God is perfectly loving, if God cares deeply for us, if God yearns passionately for us, what is there to fear? And of course, there are all those uh, scriptural passages where uh, the messengers of God say, don't be afraid, fear not. The fear that's in view here is not a cringing fear. It is not a fear of destruction. It is a holy awe. It is a recognition that there is something there greater than ourselves, beyond ourselves, beyond our comprehension. When the scriptures say that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, they are reminding us that we are not the measure of all things, either individually or collectively as humankind. In C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when the children are about to meet the great lion Aslan, the Christ figure. One of them, Susan, asks, uh, are you sure he's quite safe? To which Mr. Beaver, their guide, replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? But he is good. And so we stand, we live in the presence of this overwhelming goodness that should, if we have any sense at all, fill us with awe. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But the scriptures do not say in any place that the fear of God is the end of wisdom. 
that the fear of God is the sum of all wisdom. We are rooted in that. But we live in this universe of wonders. We live amid beauty and horror. We live with complexity. We live with greatness. And we live with pettiness. All of these things are, are part of life. And so, in the Hebrew Scriptures, there's something called the wisdom tradition, which tries to make sense of all of this. The, the wisdom tradition comprehends, includes, all of human experience and asks, how can we live wisely? How can we live completely? How can we find the right path the good path through all of this. The alternative to the way of wisdom is the way of foolishness, which is really the way of death. Now, in, in the tradition of Israel, Solomon is regarded as the great patron of wisdom, just as David is regarded as the great patron of the Psalms. Solomon is said to have written 3,000 proverbs, or wise sayings, and the book of Proverbs is traditionally attributed to him. And the legends attending Solomon, based partly on today's text, are that he was the wisest of all kings, that he was admired by his own people, by other rulers, that his counsel was always sought because of his deep insight into human affairs, into the affairs of nature. It's said that Solomon knew about birds and animals. He knew about far-off countries. He knew about deep mysteries. That's the legend that attends him. If we look at the rest of the story, uh, it becomes difficult to believe that, Simon, that Solomon was really all that wise at all. He ruined his country, or at least brought it to the edge of ruin uh, with his grandiose building projects, uh, the most magnificent of which was the temple in Jerusalem. In order to finance the, the temple and other projects, he imposed harsh taxation. He conscripted his subjects to do forced labor. He lived a lavish personal lifestyle, which was supported by people in quite a poor country. In spite of what the, the first book of Kings says about Israel and Judah uh, being beyond number, being a great and mighty nation, they lived on scrubby turf. They had precious few resources, and Solomon expected to live like the king of Egypt or the king of Persia, perhaps in an even more grandiose fashion. So by the end of his reign, the kingdom was at the breaking point. And when his son Rehoboam succeeded him, um, the more sensible counselors said it's time to cut the people some slack. Give them a break here. Back off from the taxation and the forced labor. But Rehoboam wanted to show that he was every bit the king that his father was. And so he replied, my father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. In other words, if you thought the old man was hard on you, just watch me. That led to the disintegration of the kingdom. The ten northern tribes of Israel left, leaving the house of David uh, with only the tribe of Judah. And so, as I say, from that perspective, it's hard to identify uh, Solomon as the all-wise ruler. But in this morning's reading from 1 Kings, I think that that... Solomon, in his innocence, 
Solomon, before he begins to believe all the hype about himself, does display wisdom. And the wisdom that he displays is that he knows just exactly how much he doesn't know and how much he needs to learn. And so he asks for a wise and understanding heart that will allow him to cope uh, with uh, the tasks that he has inherited. So he asks that he might know between good and evil, that he might be able to discern what is right. And that kind of humility, that, that is true wisdom. It's a wisdom that seems to have uh, deserted Solomon later on. Perhaps it's a wisdom that deserts all of us to some extent as we get to the point where we think we know everything or we become impervious. We close ourselves off to learning anything new. Now, I was mentioning um, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We celebrated the 70th anniversary of those horrors uh, just last week. Celebration, I guess, is a wrong word. We marked the 70th anniversary. When those bombs were uh, detonated and the world was trying to come to terms with what had happened, Albert Einstein said, everything has changed but our way of thinking. Thus we drift toward unparalleled uh, catastrophe. What he meant was that, that humankind had the capacity to unleash this horrific power to loose this destruction on itself, but had not yet developed the capacity to avoid using that power, had not learned how to avoid destroying itself. And so you see, wisdom, real wisdom consists in knowing how to use our intelligence, how to use the power of our minds and of our hands in a way that does not destroy, in a way that heals rather than hurts, a way that opens the future rather than closes it off. Not long ago, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, was talking about uh, the dangers to humankind uh, posed by artificial intelligence, robotics. He said that as artificial intelligence develops the capacity to reason for itself, independent of its human masters, that there is a possibility that, that artificial intelligence will rebel against us and might spell the end of humanity. Well, that sounds bizarre, doesn't it? But when Stephen Hawking is talking, I think it, it's always good to listen uh, to what he has to say. Back in the 1960s, George Grant, a Canadian philosopher, wrote a book called Technology and Empire. He talked about the imperative of technique. He said, we human beings think that we control technology, but it actually controls us because the moment something becomes possible, it will happen, no matter how destructive, uh, no matter how dire the potential consequences. He said, technology has this power. And so we might ask, for example, why it is that we embrace technologies that make so many human beings redundant. Why it is that we can't find a way uh, for people to lead productive and fulfilling lives other than being displaced by the technology that we have the capacity to create but not the capacity to manage. So, so that's one side of the equation. The other side is this denial of science uh, that's happening in, in so many circles. 
for example, denial of the science attending climate change. Oh, well, uh, the evidence is inconclusive. Scientists have not yet reached a consensus. We really don't know uh, what the data are saying. That's not true. About 98% of all scientists, about 98% of all research in the area suggests that global warming, accelerating as it is, is the result of human activity, particularly our addiction to fossil fuels. And yet we have politicians saying, well, you know, uh, we really don't know what's going on because the science is inconclusive. There are people who actually believe that the planet Earth is flat and that if you travel far enough, you'll drop off the edge. There is a flat Earth society, and I suppose some minuscule percentage of the Earth's population believes that the Earth is flat. But that doesn't mean that the evidence of the Earth being a sphere hurtling through space is inconclusive. It just means that some people are too dumb to accept the facts. And, and that's the way it is with this science denial. The, 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 science, the silencing of the scientific community, the refusal to listen, the dismissal of, of information that we need in order to survive. And so you see, wisdom, Wisdom is a two-edged thing here. It, it means accepting and being able to deal with the information, the research that's available to us. But it also means refusing to allow ourselves simply to become slaves of our technology, slaves of what we have the capacity to do. Another thing about wisdom literature, about the, the wisdom tradition, is that it teaches that a wise society and the way to live a full life, the right path, consists in pursuing justice and realizing that in your community. When I was in theology school, uh, studying Old Testament, it used to be said, on the one hand, you have the prophetic tradition, which calls us to do justice, to, to love kindness, etc. And then, on the other hand, you have the, the wisdom tradition, uh, which is, is more static. It reinforces the status quo. But if you, if you actually read the wisdom literature, You'll find over and over again these assertions that if you're going to be truly wise, that if you are going to have a wisely organized and oriented society, then you cannot have glaring inequities between rich and poor. You cannot leave some people out and allow some people to have everything. That's just foolishness. I found a verse in the book of Proverbs. It says, um, oppressing the poor in order to enrich yourself and giving to the rich leads to loss. There are some politicians who, who might heed that warning. Oppressing the poor in order to enrich yourself and giving to the rich leads to loss. Justice is part of the way of wisdom. And, and if we believe otherwise, then we are simply a collection of fools going in the wrong direction, following the path of destruction. Something else that, that occurs to me this morning from the reading uh, uh, from the letter to the Ephesians, is that, that a wise person is a thankful person. Give thanks in all things. I think that, that circles back to the beginning 
The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The, the recognition of what is beyond us. The recognition that we are not the measure of all things. Sometimes we're like Homer Simpson saying grace, you know. We bought this food and we put it on the table, but thank you God anyway. We, we think it's all about us. All about our own capacity. But if we are wise, we recognize our dependence, we recognize our contingency, we recognize our, our vulnerability, and, and so we give thanks for, for the blessings that fill our days. And then there's the Gospel of John. A lot of people these days think that's, that's appalling, talking about eating uh, Jesus' body, feeding on Jesus. I was looking at the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 9, where Lady Wisdom is personified. And there's the, the, the passage about Wisdom's Feast. Wisdom says, come and eat my bread. Drink the wine that I have mixed. Leave immaturity behind and walk and live in the way of insight. And I think it's against that kind of background that we can hear the passage in the Gospel of John. It is an invitation to enter into a relationship, in this case with Jesus. And Jesus calls us to the path of life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He, he calls us to walk the good path, the path which recognizes the otherness of God, the path which recognizes the need to navigate this world with wisdom, which recognizes justice and compassion, and ever and in all things gives thanks. And so let us now give thanks. Thanks be to God. Amen. And from More Voices, hymn number 10, Come and Seek the Ways of Wisdom. Let us pray. God, we thank you for our minds, our minds which probe the mysteries of the universe and the curiosity that animates us, makes us restless with what we know, always longing to discover more, 
to go to uncharted territories. And we give you thanks for our hearts and for that within us which knows compassion, which yearns for justice, which longs to live with wisdom and integrity in this world. We thank you for scientists. We thank you for philosophers. We thank you for theologians. We thank you for contrarians, all people who call us to think and rethink and to examine our lives in the light of what we know, in the light of what we do not know, and always with the recognition that there is much left to be known. And today we give you thanks for our new moderator, the Reverend Jordan Cantwell. We ask that she may have the gift of wisdom as she inspires the church through these changing times. And we pray that all who offer leadership in this church will walk a wise path in the days to come as we deal with tremendous changes. We pray for this congregation that we too may find the good path, that we may avoid the paths of destruction, the path of folly, and the path of despair. We pray for the community around us Especially do we remember the residents who were left homeless last Sunday. We pray that they will be lifted up by the support and compassion of the community and be able to rebuild their lives. And we pray for this country as we head toward a general election. We pray that there will be wisdom on the part of those who seek office and the wisdom and wisdom on the part of us who must make our decisions as to how we will vote. Oh God, you are always beyond us, and yet you are beside us and within us. You are far away and near at hand. We offer you our prayers. We pray that we may have a sense of how far you are and live in holy awe and a sense of how near you are and feel ourselves enfolded by your love and be reborn in hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So now it's time for the presentation of the offerings. The offerings sustain the work of this church. Your offerings will be received. God of still waiting, God of deep longing, God of the heart's true rest, hold us in fathomless peace, guard us with unwaning love, Spirit of promise, Peace. 
let us pray. The peculiar wisdom of Jesus says that we are saved by what we offer up and enriched by what we give away. Therefore, God, we bring these gifts, receive them in Jesus' name, and bless them in his service. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 642, Be Thou My Vision, verses 1 and 2, 4 and 5. It is the Spirit which helps us find the right path, the good path, the true path. It is the Spirit which helps us become wise, not only in the ways of the world, but in the things of God. So in the Spirit's power, let us go. May we be born up on those holy wings all the days of our lives. And may grace, mercy, and peace attend us now and always. Amen. Amen.